Hello friends, thank you for joining us this evening. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. Evolution Radio. Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us on this uh, December 23rd broadcast and I do greatly appreciate everybody tuning in to our live show. I'm going to be talking about the Archico volume this evening and for those that don't know it is the archaeological writings of the Sanhedrin during the time of Christ and it was preserved by Pontius Pilate placed into the public record several copies of it made in fact and it was a um, also a letter to Tiberius Caesar about the crucifixion of the Messiah as well as what he had seen and what he had experienced in being part of that whole plot, that conspiracy against Christ. Um, and he allowed himself to unwittingly be pushed into uh, fulfilling prophetically what had been entered into scripture for sev several hundreds, even millennia, um, you know, going back to Adam, who told prophetically to his children about the coming of Christ and that he would take mortal form and be immaculately conceived, uh, born of a virgin, and that he would be the Redeemer, and that he would restore them to their first estate and take them out of the bondage of Sheol. These were things that were known and passed down in the tradition of the testimonies of the patriarchs and the prophets, which um, is something that we are currently studying in examination in our Saturday broadcast, the Digital Readers Club. And if you'd like to join us, you can find the link the to our Discord channel on my Facebook page in the description for the broadcast that we do every week. Or you can just contact us at sacredwordpublishing.com and ask us about how to join the fellowship of the group, we do meet from 7 to about uh, 8.30, around that time. Um, uh, every, every Saturday to read, and currently we are studying from the Testaments of the Patriarchs and the Prophets. And in looking at and examining all of these manuscripts, we see how the story of the coming of Messiah was well known and passed on in tradition to even, you know, the generations after Seth, uh, those were the, the Magi that were vigilant in observation and that watching for the Star of Bethlehem recognized the season of Yahushua's coming. And they were the ones that were led to the miracle of his birth and his entrance into this world. And that God had, in fact, took on mortal form as he had promised. And so, what I'm going to be reading from tonight is a confession and a witness to the miracle of his coming and it's something that most people have not heard about and it is one of the manuscripts that we've recently re released and are you know have it for you to study and look into in greater detail and so in the first part of the show i'm going to read the story of how it came to public knowledge and the um, the dialogue 
of these two gentlemen, one was a he w- had access to the secret Vatican archives, and he another person that um, was a well-known researcher, investigator, and publisher. I believe he was publisher, may not, I'm not sure, but um, it was brought to his knowledge, and he did make it more widely available. And so the what I'm going to read from is a, a little bit of the dialogue between them, and this the this part gives the story of how and the portions and what compile makes up the different aspects of this manuscript. And um, uh, I was going to say that I should probably just read you the chapter headings as well, but I don't want to lose my place. Let me just read you the um, the interaction first, since I already have that. Well, no, I'll just go to the chapter headings first. And then I'll find where I am again. Okay, the table of contents for this book. Chapter 1 is how these records were discovered. Chapter 2, a short sketch of the Talmud and the Mishnah and the oral tradition, which makes up the unwritten aspect of what is Moshe, Moses' law, the Torah, which means instruction. It's the commandments and the law of the Most High as given to Moshe there on Mount Sinai. And the Talmud and the Mishnah are the oral traditions, the unwritten lore that was passed down and that followed, you know, the rabbinical teachings and the opinions of the, um, you know, the, the rabbis and the elders of interpretation of what is Torah. <clears throat> Chapter 3 is Constantine's letter in regard to having 50 copies of the scriptures written and bound. Chapter 4, Jonathan's interview with the Bethlehem shepherds. The letter of Melker, the priest of the synagogue at Bethlehem. Chapter 5 is Gamaliel's interview with Joseph and Mary and others concerning Jesus, Joshua. Chapter 6 is the report of Caiaphas to the Sanhedrin concerning the execution of Jesus. Chapter 7 is the report of Caiaphas to the Sanhedrin concerning the resurrection of Jesus. Chapter 8, Valisi's notes, Acta Pilate, or Pilate's report to Caesar of the arrest, trial, and the crucifixion of Jesus. Chapter 9 is Herod Antipater's defense before the Roman Senate in regard to his conduct at Bethlehem. Chapter 10 is Herod Antipas's defense before the Roman Senate in regard to the execution of John the Baptist. Chapter 11 is the Hillel letters regarding God's providence to the Jews by Hillel 
the third. All right. So in the very beginning of how these records were discovered. And again, this is the Artico volume. And if that didn't, for those for those that are believers, if that didn't pique your interest, um, I really don't know what would. All right, I'm going to read the first, just the first um, portion of the dialogue, and then I'm going to forward to where the individual tells him about the manuscripts. <clears throat> How these records were discovered. Sometime in the year 1856, while living in DeWitt, Missouri, a gentleman by the name of H.C. Weideman became snowbound and stopped by my house several days. He was a native of Germany and one of the most learned men I had ever met. I found, the, found him to be freely communicative. And during his stay, he told me that he had spent five years in the city of Rome and most of the time in the Vatican, where he saw a library containing 560,000 volumes. He told me that he had seen and read the records of Tiberius Caesar, and in what was called the Acta Pilati, that is, the Acts of Pilate, he had seen an account of the apprehension, trial, and crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth, but said it did not add much to the commonly accepted teachings of Christianity. He told me he thought a transcript could be secured. After Mr. Wideman's departure, I meditated upon what he had told me of those records and thought that if a transcript could be attained, it would be very interesting, even if it did not add much to the present teachings of Christianity. And so after some months, I set about tracing up Mr. Wideman as the following correspondent shows. All right, now I'm going to skip to the actual records and what the manuscripts is about because I don't need to read all the other. <clears throat> all right. Let's see here. All right, here we go. Mr. H.C. Wideman, dear sir, I hereby forward to you the transcript as it is on record in the Vatican in Tiberius Caesar's court by Pilate. I certify this to be a true copy, word for word, as it occurs there. Yours, etc., Peter Freelandson. April 26, 1859, New York. Mr. W.D. Mahan, dear sir, I am in possession of a document from H.C. Waterman with instructions to translate it into English. My charge is $10. I will expect an answer. C.C. Vandenberger. With this correspondence, I received the following document. And I must confess that although it's not inspired, yet the words burned in my heart as the words of Christ in the hearts of his disciples. And I am satisfied from the spirit it breathes that it must be true. I am aware that though the Jews were in subjection to the Romans, yet they still held their ecclesiastical authority. And the Romans not only submitted to their decisions, but executed their decrees on their subjects, knowing there was not such a piece of history to be found in all the world 
and being deeply interested myself, as also hundreds of others to whom I have read it, I have concluded to give it to the public. Upon getting hold of this report of Pilate, I commenced to investigate the subject, and after many years of trial and expenditure of considerable money, <clears throat> I've <clears throat> All right, sorry about that. I found that there were many of such records still preserved at the Vatican in Rome and at Constantinople that had been carried there by the Emperor of Rome about the middle of the third century. I therefore procured the necessary assistance and on September 21st, 1883, I set sail for those foreign lands to make the investigation in person. Believing that no event of such importance to the world as the death of Jesus of Nazareth could have transpired without some record being made of it by his enemies in their courts, legislations, and histories, I commenced investigating the subject. After many years of study and after consulting various histories and corresponding with many scholars, I received the assistance of two learned men, Dr. Mackintosh and Twyman, and went to the Vatican at Rome, and then to the Jewish... and then to the Jewish Talmuds at Constantinople. As a result, I have compiled this book, which will be found one of the most strange and interesting books ever read. It may appear fragmentary, but the reader must also must remember that it is the record of men made nearly 2,000 years ago. It was sometime in March, 1856, that my mind was awakened on the subject of this book. Almost incidentally, or it may be providentially, for he sometimes chooses the weakest things to confound the mighty. The reader is referred to the correspondence of H.C. Waterman and myself as found in this book. In God's providence, sometimes very great effects are produced from very small causes. Mr. Waterman told me he had spent five years in the Vatican at Rome, and looking over the old manuscript, he came across the records of Pilate made to Caesar. And in those records he saw where a man named Jesus was arrested, tried, and executed. He read it carefully and reread it and went back and read it again. This was the beginning of my investigation, and this book is the product of that investigation. I asked the reader to follow me patiently and see how I came to get hold of the matter contained in this book. I wondered how it was that such historians as Philo, Tacitus, Quintilian and Josephus had told us nothing or so little about Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> I asked all the wise men and scholars I met, and they did not know. I then wrote to many scholars in Europe, and they could not tell me as I could find nothing very definite from the outside world, I began to have my doubts, but came to the conclusion that the question was of too much importance to allow my mind to be fixed without a thorough investigation. I went to our histories 
Moshian, Lardner, Stackhouse, and others. They gave me no satisfaction. And I thought to myself, is it possible that the character of such men as the early Christians and the wonderful excitement that they created in their day could have been passed over and no records made of them? When I remember, too, that the Roman provinces in that day were prolific with debaters, historians, and writers on all topics that were brought before them, and that the records of the courts in those days were more carefully preserved than they are now, and that even of the trial of Gautier, who was not half as conspicuous to the people of these United States as Jesus was to the Jewish nation, there were hundreds of records made. I came to the conclusion that only Almighty God could establish a cause so universally as the Christian religion was established in the hearts of the people of this world. And a scepter them so completely as the scepter of Jesus governs this world today when they had comparatively little or no testimony from the outside world. I consulted our histories in this country, and one said these records were burned in the Alexandrian library. I knew the Babylonian Talmuds were in this library, or at least most of them were, but I also knew that the Talmuds of Jerusalem were not. I knew that when the Romans conquered the Jews and destroyed their holy city, temple and all, all the sacred treasures were taken by the Romans and I suppose preserved. Another historian says Gregory the Ninth burned all the sacred records. I found that this Roman bishop was a strong believer in Christ, as were all the Catholic Church. They follow not us and we forbid them. Why? Should they burn these records? There is no church more strongly in favor of Jesus Christ. He is their cornerstone, their foundation, their rock, their only hope. They have a different way to approach him. This does not destroy their savior. He remains the same, but they have different ways of using him as their savior. Other historians said the Jews destroyed these records, although it is strange that the Jews should destroy all their sacred records at the time to get rid of an impostor as they believed him to be. It is more likely that they would have preserved them to vindicate their actions in the future, provided they should be needed. The Jews were honest in all their dealings with Christ. They thought both he and John the Baptist were destroying their nation. And as their nation and religion were one and the same, the course Jesus was pursuing was jeopardizing all their hopes, religious and political. This is seen clearly in the defense of Caiaphas. As set forth in this book, hence, much of the prejudice among Protestants against the Jews is groundless. There never was a people more honest and devoted to their country and their God than the Jews. Many Protestants in this country and some preachers among them think that, they, that the more they denounce the Jews and Catholics, the more they serve God. The Jews were wrong in rejecting Jesus Christ as their savior. And so are those who reject him now. But when a man reads this book, he will come to the conclusion that the Jews had a better reason for rejecting Christ than men have today. And would it be right to abuse all who refuse Christ as bad men? It is still more intolerable for the members of one denomination to abuse those of another because of not worshiping Christ as they do. A difficulty I met in consulting scholars on this subject was the claim that the Roman monks had forged many manuscripts regarding Jesus Christ in the Middle Ages. Now, they may have forged some things to sustain their peculiar views, 
and doctrines something to sustain their church, but there is nothing in this book to sustain Catholicism. And if every word of it was forgotten, it would add nothing to that church more than to any other church. And then I remember the Vatican Library was one of the most extensive in the world. It has cost millions of dollars. How did those forgers know that I or any other man would come there and pay them a few dollars to get a transcript of those records? It certainly would be a very poor speculation. Another objection was that the manuscripts had been searched for by scholars and could not be found. So I set myself to work, and after investigating all the authors in this country and writing to many scholars in Europe and getting books from libraries in the old country, thus sparing no pains or expense, I could not find or even hear of a man who had ever investigated this subject. I found that Dr. Tischendorf made some investigation in these ancient manuscripts, but he was looking for the manuscript of the scriptures and might have seen many such things as this book holds and never have noticed them, just from the simple fact that he was not looking for them. He was looking for something else. In the investigation of such subjects, a man must have but one thing in his mind, and he must be posted beforehand to know how and where to look for the field is too large to make his business general. I now challenge any scholar to show me the man who has made this his special business and made the effort that I have on this particular subject. I am sure there is none. The next great difficulty that I encountered was this. Could such manuscripts exist so long? I found by investigating that possibility Ptolemy, king of Alexandria, presented 70 books to Ezra, which he refused to place in the holy canon, and it came very near bringing on a bloody war. Again, I found that Serenus Samaticus, who was the teacher of M. Antonius Africanus, son of Gordianus the Great, when he died, left his library consisting of 62,000 volumes to his student. This was in 236 AD. I also remember that the works of Homer were more than 500 years older than Christ, and that we had the laws of Shammai, Abtelian, and the works of the Hillels all before us. And if Tischendorf in the convent of St. Catherine could find slips and pieces of the Septuagint that were declared at Leipzig to be of the 4th century, I thought there might be a great deal more somewhere in the vast libraries in those old countries that have thousands of years the advantage of America. The Liberati could all tell how the manuscripts of the church might be and were preserved. But the records of its enemies, even the records of courts and crowns, they could not see into. Now, the reader must remember that there never was anything that created so much excitement in the land of Judea as the preaching of John the Baptist and Christ. This will be readily understood if we take into consideration the structure of the Jewish commonwealth. The great Sanhedrin legislated for the souls and bodies of men. That is, their religion and their politics were one and the same thing. In the capitulation made with Augustus Caesar, it was understood and agreed that the Jews were to pay a tax to the Romans. But the Romans were not to interfere with the Jewish religion. This took the executive power out of the hands of the Jews and put it into the hands of the Romans. This is the reason Jesus was sent to Pilate to be executed. The Romans had to carry out and execute the decisions of the Jewish courts on all Jewish questions. 
This is the reason Herod Antipas was tried by the Roman Senate. He had executed John the Baptist without a trial. Then we see why the Jews and the Romans work together on all questions of law. Hence the great excitement of both nations. This is the reason why Pilate made his report to Caesar. Now I say, no event creating so much excitement could take place without more or less record being made of it. For if the scripture is true, and I believe it is, there never was a man on earth who had so many followers in so short a time. Caiaphas says Jesus had been preaching three years and he then had more followers than Abraham. This causes me to say again that if the New Testament records are true, then the historical items contained in this book must also be true. And if these items, items like them, be not true, then the items of the New Testament are also not true. That is, no man dare to say these are the identical items, but items like these, and why not these? They came from the right place. The parchments and scrolls upon which they are written are such as were used in those days. But to say these are the same is to say what no man dare to say. The time has been too long, and the distance to the place where the records are kept is too great for all men to make the examination for themselves. Hence, I ask all to consider this question fairly. Let me invite the attention of the reader to the known histories in this country. Dr. Rashi, who wrote in Paris in the 12th century, says in volume three, page 190, in the formation of the ancient libraries, there were men appointed called Bailey Sufos, which means book compilers. The business of these men was to take the sheets of parchment and the various authors and pin their dates together, bind them in bundles, and have them bound with class between cedar boards. This was a trade, and it required the best of scholars to do it. They were called Bailey Sufos. We find that the works of Philo were compiled by pseudonymous Joseph ben Gurion. A.D. 150. This Ben-Gurion was a Jewish rabbi, a Pharisee and doctor. Josephus was compiled by Ikaba, a new other Jewish doctor, at the close of the second century. And so with all the historians who lived near the Christian era, Josephus was published in book form by Haverkamp in Amsterdam in 1729. Now, all he had to guide him was what Ben-Gurion had said. So it is with Philo, which was put in book form by Mangi in London in 1742. All he had was what Ikaba had pleased to compile of his works. And as there was deadly hatred between Jews and Christians at that time, it is most reasonable to believe that those compilers would leave everything out that would favor the Christians. It was to their own interest at that time to bury the very name of Christ in eternal oblivion. And this is the reason that all the historians who lived and wrote in those days are made to say so very little about Christ or his followers. Now, in looking over the histories, we find comparatively nothing said about Jesus Christ 
Such a thing could not be if the New Testament is true. No man could make me believe that such events occurred, as are recorded in the scriptures, without accounts of them being made in the state records and by the public writers of that day. Although I have had this thrown in my face so often by infidels, I never saw the reason till I commenced this investigation. And if any man will take the pains to examine this question, he will find that all the sophers or scribes were Pharisees. They were the doctors, lawyers, orators, poets, and statesmen of the times. The Hillel and Shammai schools made more scholars than all the world besides in the last days of the Jewish commonwealth. Almost every nation under the sun patronized these schools. Now, being satisfied that I was on the right track, the next thing was to find out what had become of the original manuscripts. Had Rothgad, Haverkamp, and Mengi destroyed the manuscripts when they were done with them? This I knew could not be from the fact that these parchments were either in the hands of government or individual libraries, and they could not destroy them or take them away. And I knew if these manuscripts had been kept till 1754, they must be in existence yet. Only a few years ago, there were 100 and 28 volumes of manuscripts presented to the British Museum, which were looked upon with interest. And while I am writing this, there comes to my hand a dispatch from Vienna to the London Times. I will give it in full as I think it will be beneficial to the reader. The dispatch is as follows. All right, I'm going to read this short part, and then I'm going to actually move to the manuscript. I just wanted to give you a little bit of background. Ancient Manuscripts. The sifting and arrangement of the papyrus collection bought by Archduke Rainier have led to further interesting discoveries of the hieroglyphic, hieratic, demotic, and Coptic papyra. About 20 date from the pre-Christian period. Among these is one nearly 3,000 years old. In the hieratic letter containing the representation of a funeral with a well-preserved sketch of the deceased. Some hieroglyphic legends and a demotic papyrus on the subject of mathematics. Much more numerous are the Coptic documents, about 1,000 in all, mostly letters and legal documents of the period from the 6th to the 10th century of our era. These are some important papyra containing translations of the Bible in the central Egyptian dialect of which there have hitherto been found but few specimens, and a leaf of parchment from an old octavo edition of the Book of Ruth in the Sahidi dialect. Among the Greek papyri is a hitherto unknown speech of a Socrates, one of the finest specimens of Alexandrian calligraphy. Another fragment has been found of the Book of the Thucydides manuscript, previously mentioned portions, also have been discovered of the Iliad and the paraphrase of the fourth book. Then a Menten via has been found dating from the beginning of the fourth century, being thus one of the oldest Christian manuscripts. The collection contains many well-preserved documents in an almost continuous series of the Roman and Byzantine emperors, beginning with Trajan 
and ending with Heraclius. There are also documents in the Iranian and Semitic languages. The former are written on papyrus, parchment, and skins. And among them are two fragments which it is believed will furnish the key to the Paliwi language. Among the Arab papyri, 25 documents have been found with the original leaden seals attached. They begin with a fragment of the 54th year of Higira. Another is an official document of the 19th year of the Higira appointing a revenue collector. Perhaps the most valuable part of the collection is 155 Arabian documents on cotton paper of the 8th century, which is about the time of the invention of this material by the Arabs, to the year 1953. Many thousands of manuscripts have still yet to be deciphered. In the early centuries, there was a good deal of what is known as the apologetical writings. I made it my business to examine these writings and found them to be a defense of Christianity. The first of this form of writing was presented to the Emperor Adrian by Quadratus in the year 126 A.D., a portion of this we find in Eusebius, page 93. There was another by Aristides at about the same time. These two authors are found only in fragments preserved by other historians, and their writings are mainly pleas for clemency for those who professed Christianity and were being persecuted. All right. We're going to stop there and move on into the actual manuscript. Since I know that took up the majority of the first hour. But you know, it's important to have the background. I just can't throw you into the manuscript and begin reading without you understanding what it is and how this came to, to be as far as, you know, for public consideration. All right, we're moving into Chapter 3. Constantine's letter in regard to having 50 copies of this scripture written and bound. I'll just read the first portion of this, and then we'll get into, in the second hour, the actual, um, you know, writing as far as what Constantine wrote. I mean, Pontius Pilate. It is known that the Roman Emperor Constantine, who was converted to Christian religion, had 50 copies of the scriptures made and placed in the public library for preservation. Some historian has said that they were so large, it took two men to open one of them. While in Constantinople, I found one of these volumes nicely cased, marked with the emperor's name and date upon it. To me, it was a great curiosity. I got permission with the little bashak, as they call money, to look through it. It was written on hyotikai, which is the finest of parchment, in large, bold Latin characters, quite easy to read. As far as I read it, it had many abbreviations of our present scriptures. But the facts... Sense and sentences are as full and, if anything, more complete than our English version. 
I judge it to be about two and a half by four feet square and two feet thick. It is well bound with the gold plate, 12 by 16 inches on the front with the cross and a man hanging on the cross <clears throat> with the inscription, Jesus, the son of God, crucified for the sins of the world. If the revision committee had examined and published this work, they might have said that they were giving the world something new. But so far as we examined, we saw nothing essentially different from our present Bible. Constantine's letter is on the first page, which we transcribed. The historian will remember that in the life of Constantine, written by Isubius Pamphili, Bishop of Caesarea, who served him only a few years. Eusebius writes as follows, <clears throat> quote, Ever mindful of the welfare of those churches of God, the emperor addressed me personally in a letter on the means of providing copies of the inspired oracles. His letter, which related to providing copies of the scriptures for reading in the churches, was to the following purport: Victor Constantine Maximus Augustus to Eusebius. It happens through the favoring of God our Savior that great numbers have united themselves to the most holy church in this city, which is called by my name. It seems, therefore, highly requisite since the city is rapidly advancing in prosperity in all other respects, that the number of churches should also be increased. Do you therefore receive with all readiness my determination on this behalf? I have thought it expedient to instruct your prudence to order 50 copies of the sacred scriptures, the provisions of use of which you know to be most needful from the instruction of the churches to be written on prepared parchment in a legible manner and in a commodious and portable form by transcribers thoroughly practiced in their art. The pure procurator of the diocese has also received instructions by letter from our clemency to be careful to furnish all things necessary for the preparation of such copies. And it will be for you to take special care that they be completed with as little delay as possible. You have authority also in virtue of this letter to use two of the public carriages for their conveyance by which arrangement the copies when fairly written, will most easily be forwarded for my personal inspection. And one of the deacons of your church may be entrusted with this service, who on his arrival shall experience my liberality. God preserve you, beloved brother. <clears throat> Now, this was done about 327 years after the great questions were started and only about 270 years after the last apostle was dead. Suppose someone should write a book denying that such a man as Washington ever lived, a book denying that a book denying that such a man as Washington ever lived, that there never was a revolution of the United States against the King of England, what would people say of him? The children of this country would rise up and show him to be false. The, then suppose there never was such a man as Jesus Christ, that he never was born at Bethlehem, that he never had any disciples, 
that they never organized a Christian church. And suppose someone should say there was no persecution of the Christian church for 200 years. What would you think of a king doing such a thing as making the above described books? Remember, too, that nothing was written in those days but the most important affairs of life because only a few men could write and the means of writing were limited. Now, the existence of these writings was never denied for 12 to 1400 years afterward. Their intent and spirituality may have been denied, but the facts never were. Now, what ought we to think of a man who would deny events that occurred 2000 years ago that were recorded in the records of kings and historical writers when he had not one single record to prove it? How can he know that such records are false? He would have no history, no records of those days to prove it. And if they were false, is it not reasonable to think that they would have been proved so then? Amen to that. All right, now we are going into the actual scriptures. Chapter 4 is Jonathan's interview with the Bethlehem shepherds, the letter of Melchor, the priest of the synagogue at Bethlehem. Now, I'm not going to start right now because we got three minutes to break. But I want to reemphasize that very last question in the very third chapter of this book. For those that deny Jesus Christ as a historical figure, or that he lived a life of such importance that people actually became disciples unto him, and that believing in the miracle of his ministry and, more importantly, his Godhead and his divine providence, that they were willing to give their lives up to stand for the truth of his salvation, of his resurrection, and his incarnation as God, immaculately conceived, born of a virgin, entered into this world as Redeemer, Messiah, and Savior to the world. For people that would deny that they should consider this book and the purpose of its having been written and this individual's lifelong dedication to investigating its truth and to bringing it forth for all of us. And it's in that spirit that we, my children and myself, and Sacred Word Publishing as a company, that we republish this narrative to bring it to you for consideration. Because, you know, we are, in my opinion, that last generation that will see the return and the second coming of Christ. The scriptures say of the fig tree generation and those that are alive in this times that we would be those that witness the fulfillment of all things, of all the prophecies, of all the ancient manuscripts, all the ancient scriptures that have been preserved and written down by the prophets as a legacy for our witness. Enoch said that he was writing for a distant and remote generation. We are that generation. And so it's for those that still deny that we bring this forth as a witness of truth of what occurred, you know, 2,000 years ago, if it's 
that long. I mean, with the timeline and all of that, who who really even knows now? But certainly, it is a witness to that time that Christ was in flesh and walking in this world. All right, we'll be right back and we'll get into it. As a bookstore for truth seekers, it's our goal to make ancient manuscripts which were once held captive by secretive institutions available for public consideration. In our generation where wisdom has increased as Daniel the prophet foretold, we have access to many of the testimonies our early church brethren were persecuted for preserving. After being hidden for centuries, these manuscripts have been leaked from various sources throughout the earth. And it's our goal to gather these sources into printable form to make available for all who seek the ancient way. If you're looking to deepen your studies of the biblical narrative, find these ancient manuscripts and more at sacredwordpublishing.com. constantly studying alone. But there is a place where we can come together. The Digital Readers Club is our online ecclesia meant for those who've forsaken churchianity but still want the closeness of a family to study with. Join us every Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time to put together the puzzle pieces of truth scattered throughout the ancient scriptures. Every day, questions arise. Are the stories in the Bible true? What if I told you that there are hundreds of confirming witnesses? Which give intricate detail to the stories in the Bible. Have you ever found yourself deep in the rabbit hole with questions that no one seemed to have the answers to? Join us the second Friday of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern Time for our Ask Me Anything series with author and researcher Zen Garcia as he sheds light on the mysteries which have us all searching together. Your partnership with Sacred Word Publishing goes further than the publishing of ancient manuscripts and weekly video content. You also make a huge impact across the earth in orphanages in Myanmar, India, Uganda, and Kenya. Your support is crucial for the development of the Ecclesia of Real Truth Seekers. We thank you for joining us in hosting Secrets Revealed, Momentary Zen, the Digital Readers Club, Ask Me Anything series, and other shows that have helped lead so many to the truth of salvation. To become even more involved, please visit patreon.com slash sacredwordpublishing where you can partake in exclusive, interactive, patron-only content and help us continue shining the light of love in this darkened world. All right, welcome back, everybody, for our second hour. We are speaking about the Archco volume. Uh, but before I move into the eyewitness testimony, um, Erickson... Manliquez asks a question. Zen, what happened to the Roman soldier Longinus after Yahushua healed his eyes? Is it true he became immortal? Uh, well, he was sainted. And if you don't know the story of Longinus, I released, there's a Thracian Chronicle manuscript called The Chronicles of Longinus who was a Thracian soldier employed by the Romans. 
just as Spartacus was a Roman, I mean, a Thracian gladiator, and that he was enslaved by the Romans and led the uprising, uh, where all of the gladiators, you know, successfully revolted against uh, and freed many of the slaves to challenge the, the power of the state at that time. But Longinus being the one that pierced the side of Christ during his crucifixion, that when the blood dribbled into his blind eye, he became healed. And not only was his eye healed, but he also acquired the ability to see spiritually into the things of this world. And so he was given supernatural sight. And the Chronicles of Longinus, uh, it's an 18-chapter book that speaks about his transformation and how seeing the events unfolding in the heavens and upon the earth, the three hours of darkness, and after his healing, he sought out the apostles and speaking with them and speaking uh, especially to um, to Mary, Mary Magdalene and Lazarus, he became a believer and a disciple and he left uh, the work, his employment as a soldier and started to preach the gospel. And he was he was sainted. However, he did die. He was killed. He was martyred for his belief. But in the sense that he was a believer in Christ, yes, he did become immortal in in the manner that after his death, he went on to be with the Lord. And he is preserved uh, and apportioned with the elect and the apostles of old. And so, in that sense, yes, he's immortal. All right, we're going to go ahead and get into it. And I thank, again, all of you for joining us. Thank you, Tammy, for moderating. We appreciate you, sister. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get into the story now. I hope you enjoy, as I think you will. For how could you not? All right. Jonathan, son of Heziel, questions the shepherds and others at Bethlehem in regard to the strange circumstances reported to have occurred there and then reports to the Sanhedrin court. Jonathan to the masters of Israel, servants of the true God, in obedience to your order I met with two men who said they were shepherds and were watching their flocks near Bethlehem. They told me that while attending to their sheep, the night being cold and chilly, some of them had made fires to warm themselves, and some of them had laid down and were asleep, that they were awakened by those who were keeping watch with the question, what does all this mean? Behold, how light it is that when they were aroused, it was light as day. But they knew it was not daylight, for it was only the third watch. All at once, the air seemed to be filled with human voices, saying, Glory, glory to the Most High God, and happy art thou, Bethlehem, for God hath fulfilled his promise to the fathers. For in thy chambers is born the King that shall rule in righteousness." Their shoutings would rise up in the heavens and then would sink down in mellow strains 
and roll along at the foot of the mountains and die away in the most soft and musical manner they had ever heard. Then it would begin again, high up in the heavens, in the very vaults of the sky, and descend in sweet and melodious strains, so that they could not refrain from shouting and weeping at the same time. The light would seem to burst forth high up in the heavens, and then descend in softer rays and light up the hills and valleys, making everything more visible than the light of the sun, though it was not so brilliant, but clearer like the brightest moon. I asked them how they felt if they were not afraid. They said at first they were, but after a while it seemed to calm their spirits and so fill their hearts with love and tranquility that they felt more like giving thanks than anything else. They said it was around the whole city and some of the people were almost scared to death. Some said the world was on fire. Some said the gods were coming down to destroy them. Others said a star had fallen until Melker, the priest, came out shouting and clapping his hands, seeming to be frantic with joy. The people all came crowding around him, and he told them that it was the sign that God was coming to fulfill his promise made to their father, Abraham. He told us that 1,400 years before God had appeared to Abraham, and told him to put all Israel under bonds, sacred bonds of obedience. And if they would be faithful, he would give them a savior to redeem them from sin, and that he would give them eternal life, and that they should hunger no more, that the time of their suffering should cease forever and that the sign of his coming would be that light would shine from on high, and that the angels would announce his coming, and their voices should be heard in the city, and the people should rejoice. And a virgin that was pure. Should travail in pain and bring forth her firstborn, and he should rule all flesh by sanctifying it and making it obedient. After Melker had addressed the people in a loud voice, he and all the old Jews went into the synagogue and remained there praising God and giving thanks. I went to see Melker, who related to me much the same as the shepherds had reported. He told me that he had lived in India and that his father had been priest at Antioch, that he had studied the sacred scrolls of God all his life, and that he knew that the time had come from signs given for God to visit and save the Jews from Roman oppression and from their sins. And as evidence, he showed me many quotations on the tripod respecting the matter. He said that next day, three strangers from a great distance called on him and they went in search of this young child and they found him and his mother in the mouth of the cave. Where there was a shed projecting out from the sheltering of sheep. That his mother was married to a man named Joseph. And she related to them the history of her child, saying that an angel had visited her
and told her that she should have a son and she should call him Jesus. For he should redeem his people from their sins and he should call her blessed forevermore. Whether this is true or not remains to be proved in the future. There have been so many imposters in the world, so many babes born under pretended miracles, and all have proved to be a failure, that this one may be false, this woman only wishing to hide her shame or court the favor of the Jews. I am informed that she will be tried by our law, and if she can give no better evidence of her virtue than she has given to Melker, she will be stoned according to our law. Although, as Melker says, there never has been a case before with such apparent divine manifestations as were seen on this occasion. In the past, in various instances, virgins have pretended to be with child by the Holy Ghost, but at the time of their delivery there was no light from the heavens and no angels talking among the clouds and declaring that this is the king of the Jews. And as to the truth of these things, the whole of the people of Bethlehem testified to having seen it, and the Roman guard also came out and asked what it meant, and they showed by their actions that they were very much alarmed. These things, Melker says, are all declared in the scriptures to be the sign of his coming. Melker is a man of great learning and well-versed in the prophecies, and he sends you this letter referring you to those prophecies. Melker, the priest of the synagogue of Bethlehem, to the higher Sanhedrin of the Jews at Jerusalem. Holy masters of Israel, I, your servant, would call your attention to the words of the prophet in regard to the forerunner and the rise as well as the conductor of a great and mighty nation, wherein should dwell the true principles of righteousness and the conductor of the outward formation of a national domain of God upon earth, as evidence of the fact, the vision and affliction that has befallen Zacharias of late is enough to satisfy all men of the coming of some great event. And this babe of Elizabeth is the beginning of better times. What has occurred here? in the last few days, as Jonathan will inform you, forever settles the question that the day of our redemption is drawing nigh. The sections of these divisions are three. First, the general survey. The original foundation and destiny of man is in his single state. The protoevangelium, the full development of mankind, the promised to the fathers of the covenant people. Judah, the leader tribe, section second, the Mosaic law and the Mosaic outlook, the prophecy of Balaam, section third, the anointed one and the prophets of the past exile, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Malachi's prophecy of the forerunner of the Lord. Now, noble masters of Israel, if you will refer to the several sections of the divine word, you will not fail to see that all that has been spoken by the prophets in regard to the works of God upon earth has been fulfilled in the last few days. In the two events, the birth of the child of Elizabeth and that of Mary of Bethlehem. The unlimited freedom which some men take with these holy writings of God, as to the above prophecy, subjects us to the severest criticism. It is, however, most satisfactory to see and hear that the divine grandeur and authority of the sacred oracles are in no way dependent on the solution of carnal critics, but rest on an inward light shining everywhere 
out of the bosom of a profound organic unity and an interconnected relation with an incons with a consistent and united theology overleaping all time the historical present as well as the past and all the past brought to write in these two events that have just transpired. Indeed, all past time is blending with the present horizon, and the works of God in ages past are just beginning to develop themselves at this particular time, and the present scenes are bringing us close on to the ways of God upon earth. While we reverence these men of God, we should not misquote their language. Take, for example, the third section of Isaiah, where he prophesies of the captive Israelites instead of his consolation to the captive. While one of his words refers to the future condition and the reason, therefore, the other is sweet in consolation of the Israelites while in this state of captivity and full of the blessed promises in the future. But let the spirit of prophecy bear us on with the prophet into future time, far beyond the kingdoms of this world, into a glorious future, regardless of the Roman, Babylonian, or even the Maccabean rule or rulers, but never forgetting that the prophet is one who is divinely inspired and is called, commissioned, and qualified to declare the will as well as the knowledge of God. Yes, he is a seer. His prophecy is the nature of a vision involving and enveloping all the faculties of the soul and placing the prophet in the attitude of God, of being outside the body and independent of it. Yea, far better without the body than with it. For the further the soul gets from the body, the more active it becomes. This fact is demonstrated in our dreams. The vivid powers of the soul are much more active in dreams than at any other time. The perception is clearer, and the sensitive faculties are much more alive when asleep than when awake. We see this verified in the man dying. His eye is usually brighter. His mind is clearer, his soul is freer and less selfish as he passes on and nears the eternal state. So is the prophet. He becomes so personal with God that he uses the personalities with seeming presumption while it is the indwelling power of God's spirit, inflating the soul and setting the tongue on fire. So was the moving language of the words to which you have been referred. It seems to me those men of God saw distinctly the gathering light. They saw the travailing of the virgin. They saw the helpless infant in the sheep trough. They heard the mighty chanting of the heavenly host. They saw the ambition of human nature in the Roman soldiery aiming to destroy the child's life. And in that infant they saw human nature in its fallen and helpless condition. And it appears as if they saw the advance of that infant into perfect manhood as he becomes the theme of the world. His advancing nature will triumph over all as he does escape the Roman authority this day. So he will finally triumph over all the world and even death itself shall be destroyed. We as Jews place too much confidence in the outward appearance while the idea we get of the kingdom of heaven is all of a carnal nature consisting of forms and ceremonies. The prophecies referred to and many other passages that I might mention all go to show that the kingdom of God is to begin within us in the inner life and the rule there. And from the inner nature, all outward actions are to flow in conformity with the revealed and written teachings and commands of God. 
So is the spirit of prophecy. While it uses the natural organs of speech, it at the same time controls all the faculties of life, producing sometimes a real ecstasy, not mechanical or loss of consciousness, though cut off from the time from external relations. He is thus circumscribed to speak, as did Balaam, the words of God, with human life. This is to be held by us Jews as of the first. and greatest importance. And we are to remember that his prophecy has the same reference to the future that it does to the past and has respect to the whole empire of man. While it specifies individuals and nation, it often has reference to doctrines and principles. And in this light, Israel is the result of prophecy as a nation with her religious teachings. So is this virgin's babe born to be a ruler of all nations of the earth. The Torah itself goes back to prophecy as well as every prophet stands on the Torah and on this rests all prophecy pronouncing condemnation on the disobedient and blessings on the faithful. It was on this principle that the covenant of inheritance was made with Abraham, and in reality so made with David. Thus all the promises, political, ethical, judicial, and ritual, rest on the Torah. In short, the whole administration finds its authority in the prophetic vision as set forth by the commands of God to regulate human life, commencing in the inner life and working outward until the outward is like the inward and thus advancing on from individuals to nations. The messianic prophecy has no other justification than this. On this rests the church and on this rests the theocracy. On this rests the glory of the future kingdom of God upon earth the whole chain of prophecy is already fulfilled in this babe but the development is only commencing he will abolish the old cultus forever but with man it will develop commensurate with time itself there are many types in the shadow in the plant in the animal every time the romans celebrate a triumph on the tiber it shadowed forth the coming Caesar. So every suffering of David or lamentation of Job or glory of Solomon, yea, every wail of human sorrow, every throw of human grief, every dying sigh, every failing bitter tear was a type, a prophecy of the coming king of the Jews and the savior of the world. Israel stands as a common factor at every great epoch of history. The shading of the colors of the prophetic painting does not obliterate the prediction of the literal Israel's more glorious future in the kingdom of God. Her historic calling to mediate salvation to the nations is not ended with this newcomer on the stage of earthly life. The prophecy is eschatological, refining the inner life as well as shaping the outer life in conformity to good laws, looking also to the end of time and its great importance to us. It has something to teach and we have something to learn. Along the ages past, all the great, good, and happy have first learned their duties and then perform them. And thus, for thousands of years, Israel has stood, hope never dying, in the Hebrew heart, and has been the only appointed source of preserved knowledge of the true God. 
And this day she stands as the great factor and center around which all nations of the earth must come for instruction to guide them that they may become better and happier. These sacred scrolls which we Jews receive from God by the hand of Moshe are the only hope of the world. If they were lost to mankind, it would be worse than putting out the sun, moon, and all the stars of night, for this would be a loss of sacred light to the souls of men. When we consider the surroundings, there never has been a time more propitious than the present for the establishing of the true religion. And it seems, by reviewing our history for hundreds of years past, that this is the time for the ushering in of the true kingdom of God. The nations of the earth that have been given to idolatry are growing tired of placing confidence in and depending on gods that do not help them in the hour of danger. And they are now wanting a God that can and will answer their calls. King Herod sent for me the other day, and after I related to him of the God of the Jews and his works, of the many and mighty deeds he had performed for our fathers and for us as a nation, he seemed to think if there was such a God as we professed, it was far better than to depend on such gods as the Romans had made of timber, stone, and iron. And even the gods of gold were powerless. He said that if he could know that this babe that was declared by the angels was such a god as he had that saved the Israelites in the Red Sea and saved Daniel and those three from the fearful heat of fire, he would have pursued quite a different course. Toward him. He was under the impression that he had come to drive the Romans from their possessions and to reign as a monarch instead of Caesar. And I find this to be the general feeling throughout the world, so far as I can hear, that the people want and are ready to receive a God that can demonstrate in his life that he is such a God that the race of men can depend on in time of trouble. And if he can show such power to his friends, he will be feared by his enemies and thus become universally obeyed by all nations of the earth. And this, I fear, is going to be a trouble with our nation. Our people are going to look to him as a temporal deliverer and will aim to circumscribe him to the Jews alone. And when his actions begin to flow out, to all the inhabitants of the world in love and charity, as is most certainly shown forth in the ninth section of the Holy Prophet, then I fear the Jews will reject him. And in fact, we are warned of that already in the third section of Jeremiah's word. To avoid this, Israel must be taught that the prophecy of Isaiah does not stop with the Babylonian captivity and return to the kingdom of heaven, and that Ezekiel's wheels do not whirl politically or spiritually in heaven, but upon earth, and have reference to earthly revolutions or changes, and show the beginning to pass of the great events of which this of Bethlehem is the grandest of all. Neither is the outlook of Daniel to be confined to the shade of the Maccabean wall of Jewish conquest, nor are these great questions to be decided by our unsuccessful attempts to find out what the prophet meant or what he might have understood himself to mean. But from the unity, totality, and organic connection of the whole body of prophecy, as referring to the kingdom this world, becoming subject to the kingdom of the Savior of all men. We, as Jews, 
are the only people that God has entrusted with the great questions. And of course, the world will look to and expect us to give interpretation to these questions. And as we are entrusted with these things, God will hold us responsible if we fail to give the true light on this subject. Up to this time, I am fearful the Jews as a nation are as much divided and perhaps as much mistaken as to the nature of his works as any other people. I find by conversing with the Romans, Greeks, and others that all their knowledge of these things of Jewish expectation of a Redeemer has been attained from the Jews either directly or indirectly. And it was through them Herod got the idea of his being a temporal king and to rule and reign by the might of carnal weapons. Whereas if we consult the spiritual import of the prophets, his office is to blend all nations in one common brotherhood and establish love in the place of law. And that heart should throb high with love to heart. And under this law, universal peace. Wherever one should meet another, they should meet as friends. For what else can the prophet mean in section 9 where he shows that this king shall destroy all carnal weapons? And shows that the king shall destroy all carnal weapons and convert them to a helpful purpose and thus become the active worker in doing good to all men and teaching all men to do good to each other. By reading all the scrolls of God, we find that the unity and totality of all the prophets go to bear us out in this idea, and all have reference to this babe of Bethlehem. Be right back. I'm going to get a sip, everyone. If we consult them as to the time, taking the revolutions of Ezekiel's wills, they show plainly that the revolutions of the different governments of the world fix this as the time. Next, consult them in regard to the individuals connected with this great event. These are pointed to as the virgin wife by Zacharias. Next, the place has been pointed out and named, then the light and the appearing of the angels have all been set forth, and also the opposition of the Romans has been declared. Now I ask the high court of the living God to look well on these things and tell us how men that lived in different ages of the world, that lived in different portions of the country, Men that never knew each other, men that were not prophesying for a party of men that had no personal interest in the subject as men, men that jeopardized, and some of them lost their lives on account of having uttered these prophecies. How could they all point out the place, the time, and the names of the parties so plain and clear if it was not revealed to them? and ordained by God himself. I understand that the Romans and some of the priests have been saying that Zacharias was a hypocrite and that Mary was a bad woman. Such might be the case so far as man is able to judge. But who 
I ask can forge such truth as these prophecies and make them come true? Or who can cause light to descend from the heavens and the angels come down and make the declaration that this was the Son of God, King of the Jews. Noble masters of the Sanhedrin, I was not alone. I am not the only witness of these things. The principal people of Bethlehem saw them and heard them as I did. I would say to you, if this is not the Jews' king, then we need not look for any other. For every line of prophecy has been most completely fulfilled in him. And if he does not appear and save his own people, I shall despair of ever being released. And I shall believe that we have misinterpreted the meaning of all the prophets. But I feel so sure that this is he I shall wait in expectation and with much anxiety. And I have no fears of any harm befalling him. All the Romans in the world cannot harm him. And although Herod may rage and may destroy all the infants in the world, the same angels that attended his birth will watch over him through life. And the Romans will have to contend with the same God that Pharaoh did and will meet with similar defeat. Chapter 5. Gamaliel's interview with Joseph and Mary and others concerning Jesus. The Hagiographa, or Holy Writings, found in the St. Sophia Mosque at Constantinople, made by Gamaliel in the Talmuds of the Jews, 27 B.C. 27 B. I don't, I don't believe they had a B.C. and an A.D. then. So 27 B. Um, let me also just tell you that Gamaliel was the chief Pharisee, the most respected, uh, the highly revered. He was the teacher of Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul. And he was also the brother of Nicodemus and Joseph. A lot of people don't know that, but Joseph of Arimathea, who, who was the uncle of Yahushua. Now, remember that Zacharias is the mother, I mean, the father of John the Baptist, and that Elizabeth, his mother, was the cousin of Mary, and that Joseph also, whom was the caretaker and the guardian of Mary, that he was part of the priesthood. He was well-respected and a very knowledgeable man in regard to the law, as was Nicodemus. Both Nicodemus and Gamaliel were very well-respected, respe as was both Joseph, and, uh, Joseph of Arimathea and um, Joseph that took care of Mary. And both of them became converts. And it's through Gamaliel that we have the most profound writing on the Passion of Christ. It's called the Gasp Gospel of Gamaliel, which I know not a lot of people have heard about it, and not many of you have read it. Uh, but we do have that in book form as well at sacredwordpublishing.com as well as the Gospel of Nicodemus, who tells the story of the Passion and also of Christ's descent into Sheol. Because he was one of the ones that, uh, being part of the Pharisees, 
he received the testimony of Corinthian and Lucius, who were the two sons of Simeon that were resurrected as part of those that were brought forth out of the grave. And being unable to speak, they were asked to write the testimony of what they witnessed. And they described how they were in Sheol and that Christ came down, broke open the doors of iron, the gates of brass, and took Adam and all of his descendants up into paradise and baptized them in the Churisian lake. Uh, most of them entered into uh, New Jerusalem along with the thief that, you know, he said, this day you will be with me in paradise. But some were brought to Jerusalem and were allowed to walk for 40 days as a witness to the resurrection of Christ and his bringing liberty to the captives. All right, continuing. It seems Gamaliel was sent by the Sanhedrin to interrogate Joseph and Mary in regard to this child, Jesus. He says, I found Joseph and Mary in the city of Mecca in the land of Ammon or Moab. Remember, they had to run. They were told by the angel to go to Egypt. But I did not find Jesus. When I went to the place where I was told he was, he was somewhere else, and thus I followed him from place to place until I despaired of finding him at all. Whether he knew that I was in search of him and did it to elude me, I cannot tell, though I think it most likely the former was the reason. For his mother says he is bashful and shuns company. Joseph is a woodworkman. He is very tall and ugly. His hair looks as though it might have been dark auburn when young. His eyes are gray and vicious. He is anything but prepossessing in his appearance, and he is as gross and glum as he looks. He is but a poor talker, and it seems that yes and no are the depth of his mind. I am satisfied he is very disagreeable to his family. His children look very much like him, and upon the whole, I should call them a third-rate family. I asked him who were his parents. He said his father's name was Jacob, and his grandfather was Matthew. He did not like to talk on the subject. He is very jealous. I told him that we had heard that he had a vision, and I was sent to ascertain the facts in the case. He said he did not call it a vision, he called it a dream. He said after he and Mary had agreed to marry, it seemed that something told him that Mary was with child, that he did not know whether he was asleep or awake, but it made such an impression on his mind that he concluded to have nothing more to do with her. And while he was working one day under a shed, all at once a man in snowy white stood by his side and told him, not to doubt the virtue of Mary, for she was holy before the Lord, that the child conceived in her was not by man, but by the Holy Ghost, and that the child would be free from human passions. In order to do this, he must, that is, his humanity, must be of the extract of Alma, that is, the Hebrew word for virgin that he might endure all things and not resist, and fill the demands of prophecy. He said that the angel told him that this child should be great and should rule all the kingdoms of this world. He said that this child should set up a new kingdom wherein should dwell righteousness and peace, and that the kingdoms of this world which should oppose him, God would utterly destroy. I asked him, how could a virgin conceive of herself without the germination of the male? He said, this is the work of God. He has brought to life the womb of Elizabeth. So she had conceived and will bear a son in her old age who will go before and tell the people of the coming of this king. After telling me all these things, 
He disappeared like the melting down of a light. I then went and told Mary what had occurred, and she told me that the same angel, or one like him, had appeared to her and told the same things. So I married Mary, thinking that if what the angel had told us was true, it would be greatly to our advantage. But I am fearful we are mistaken. Jesus seems to take no interest in us, nor anything else much. I call him lazy and careless. I do not think he will ever amount to much, much less to be a king. If he does, he must do a great deal better than he has been doing. I asked him how long after that interview with the angel before the child was born. He said he did not know, but he thought it was seven or eight months. I asked him where they were at the time. He said in Bethlehem. The Roman commander had given orders for all the Jews to go on a certain day to be enrolled as taxpayers, and he and Mary went to Bethlehem as the nearest place of enrollment, and while there this babe was born. I asked if anything strange occurred there that night. He said that the people were much excited, but he was so tired that he had gone to sleep and saw nothing. He said toward day there were several priests came in to see them and the babe and gave them many presents. And the news got circulated that this child was to be king of the Jews. And it created such an excitement that he took the child and his mother and came to Moab for protection, for fear the Romans would kill the child to keep it from being a rival to the Romans. I discovered that all Joseph's ideas were of a selfish kind. All he thought of was himself. Mary is altogether a different character, and she is too noble to be the wife of such a man. She seems to be about 40 or 45 years of age, abounds with a cheerful and happy spirit, and is full of happy fancies. She is fair to see, rather fleshly, has soft and innocent-looking eyes, and seems to be naturally a good woman. I asked her who her parents were, and she said her father's name was Eli, and her mother's name was Anna. Her grandmother's name was Fennel, a widow of the tribe of Asher, of great renown. I asked her if Jesus was the son of Joseph. She said he was not. I asked her to relate the circumstances of the child's history. She said that one day while she was grinding some meal, there appeared at the door a stranger in shining raiment which showed as bright as the light. She was very much alarmed at his presence and trembled like a leaf, but all her fears were calmed when he spoke to her. For he said, Mary, thou art loved by the Lord, and he has sent me to tell thee that thou shalt have a child, that this child shall be great and rule all nations of the earth. She continued, I immediately thought of my engagement to Joseph and supposed that was the way of the child was to come. But he astonished me the more when he told me that cousin Elizabeth had conceived and would bear a son whose name was to be John, and my son should be called Jesus. This caused me to remember that Zacharias had seen a vision and disrupted and disputed with the angel, and for that he was struck with dumbness so that he could no longer hold the priest's office. I asked the messenger if Joseph knew anything of the matter. He said that he told Joseph that I was to have a child by command of the Holy Ghost, and that he was to redeem his people from their sins, and was to reign over the whole world, that every man should confess to him, and he should rule over all the kings of the earth. I asked her, how she knew that he was an angel, and she said he told her so, and then she knew he was an angel from the way he came and went. I asked her to describe how he went away from her, and she said that he seemed to melt away like the extinguishing of a light. I asked her if she knew anything of John the Baptist. She said he lived in the mountains of Judea, the last she knew of him. I asked her, if he and Jesus were acquainted, or did they visit? She said she did not think they knew each other. I asked her if at the time this angel, as she called him, 
visited her, she was Alma, that is virgin. She said she was, and that she had never showed to man, nor was known by any man. I asked her if she at that time maintained her for Shet, and after making her and Joseph understand what I meant, they both said she had, and Joseph said this was the way he had of testing her virtue. I asked her if she knew when conception took place. She said she did not. I asked her if she was in any pain in bearing or in delivering this child. She said none of any consequence. I asked her if she was healthy to give me a description of his life. She said he was perfectly healthy, that she never heard him complain of any pain or dissatisfaction. His food always agreed with him that he would eat anything set before him. And if anyone else complained, he would often say he thought it good enough, much better than we deserved. She said that Joseph was a little hard to please, but this boy had answered him so often, and his answers were so mild and yet so suitable that he had almost broken him of finding fault. She said he settled all the disputes of the family that no odds what was the subject or who it was. One word from him closed all mouths, and what gave him such power was his words were always unpretending and spoken as though they were not intended as a rebuke, but merely as a decision. I asked her if she had ever seen him angry or out of humor. She said she had seen him apparently vexed, and grieved at the disputes and follies of others, but had never seen him angry. I asked her if he had any worldly aspirations after money or wealth or a great name, or did he delight in fine dress like the most of youth? She said that was one thing that vexed her. He seemed to take no care of his person. He did not care whether he was dressed or not, or whether the family got along well or ill. It was all alike to, to him. She said she'd talk to him about it, and he would look at her a little grieved and say, Woman, for such he always called me. You do not know who I am. Indeed, she said, he talks. He takes so little interest in the things of the world and the great questions of the day. They were beginning to despair of his ever amounting to much much less to be a king, as the angel said he would be. If so, he would have to act very differently from what he was acting at that time. I told her that the Jewish doctors contended that the amorous disposition is peculiar to the male. I asked her if she had ever seen in the private life of Jesus any sign of such disposition. She said she had not. I asked if she saw him in any particular fondness for female society. She said she had not. If anything, rather the contrary, that the young, Bethal, the word in the Hebrew for young women, were all very fond of him and were always seeking his society, and yet he seemed to care nothing for them. And if they appeared too fond of him, he treated them almost with scorn. He will often get up and leave them and wander away and spend his time in meditation and prayer. He is a perfect ascetic in his life. When I see how the people like to be with him and ask him questions and seem to take such delight with his answers, both men and women, it almost vexes me. They say there is a young woman in Bethany whom he intends to marry, but unless he changes his course very much, he will never be qualified to have a family. But I do not believe the report. He never seems to me to care anything about women when he is in my presence. Okay, we're going to have to stop there. I will do a part two and bring just a few more portions of this manuscript forward. I think um, it will interest you. And especially I want to bring forth the, the report of Pontius Pilate because he gives an eyewitness account of the physical description of Yahushua, what he looks like, uh, the whole thing of the passion, 
uh, the crucifixion, the court trial, all of that, and what occurred during his crucifixion, which I think is important because it shows the miracle of God, you know, and his punishment on the world for having killed his son. All right. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Good night. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for this video and this broadcast. We appreciate all of you and thank you for your patronage. Please do like and subscribe and share with your friends. God bless all of you and your seeking.